Testing, testing, hello. Hello, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to the 2023 Multidisciplinary Undergraduate Research Conference. We are all so excited to have you here. My name is Isabel, this is Monica, and we are your co-chairs for the Merck Planning Committee. Monica and I have been working alongside nine other student leaders over the past six months to bring you this conference. We're so, so excited for you guys to see all the wonderful research done by the UBC community. We would like to thank the UBC Courier Center, the Center for Community Engaged Learning, and Rogers for graciously supporting the creation of this year's conference. Before we get started, we would like to acknowledge that Vancouver's UBC Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. We invite you all to think deeper about what that land acknowledgement means to you today and take a moment to reflect on the meaning of those words. Traditional, which means that the land has been historically occupied by indigenous peoples, Ancestral, which means that it has been passed down through generations. And unceded, which means that it has not been turned over through a treaty or by any other agreement. We also acknowledge that given the virtual component of this conference, there are people coming from near and far to present. And we acknowledge the caretakers and owners of those lands as well. This year's iteration of Merck is particularly special because it marks our 20th anniversary. Over the years, we've had the opportunity to showcase countless fascinating research projects and support the growth of our researchers. This year again, we are able to celebrate all of the fantastic undergraduate research done right here at UBC. So we congratulate all of you, the undergraduate researchers. You have worked so hard, and this is your chance to share that work with your fellow students, staff, faculty, and community members. For those of you who are going to see the poster presentations today, we had a glimpse last night, and it is truly beautiful to see them in person again rather than on a screen. At Merck, what's special is that we have researchers who are at all different stages of their journey. And so we appreciate the opportunity to see all of your learning and growth come to fruition, whether this is your first research presentation or maybe your fifth. We also, of course, want to acknowledge all of the graduate students, postdoctorate fellows, and professors whose support and guidance have truly allowed you to flourish as undergraduate researchers. Today, we're looking forward to learning more about all of the work you've put in, as well as all of the knowledge you've contributed not only to your individual fields, but to society as a whole. Merck is UBC's largest undergraduate research conference, and we are so thrilled to have over 500 present presenters and over 300 presentations this year, which is the largest that the conference has been in its history of 20 years. This year's theme for the conference is Aspire and Inspire, which aims to encourage you to draw from your own life experiences to inspire innovative solutions. We look forward to seeing where your research aspirations have led you so far, and we invite you to gain inspiration from other people's research here today. This morning, we are proud to produce Professor Mika McKinnon as our keynote speaker. Professor McKinnon is a geophysicist, science communicator, and disaster researcher who completed her master's degree in science right here at UBC in 2010. Professor McKinnon specializes in sharing geoscience with the media in creative ways, and she applies her disaster expertise to both research and communications. Professor McKinnon is also an on-screen specialist in several documentary series, as well as a behind-the-screens consultant for popular TV shows and movies like Star Trek Discovery. Her multifaceted career path allows her to apply her research in many different methods and fields and communicate her findings to the public, which is the true spirit of Merck. We ask you to give her a warm welcome to the Merck stage today. Did we get my microphone turned on? Yes, we did. All right. Are we good levels? Yes. All right. Hi, I'm Mika. A uh, little bit of a disclosure, I am currently pregnant, which means you're going to hear me be breathless throughout this. One of the many things I didn't tell you is that even when you've got the lung capacity, your blood volume doubles, and that's really hard to keep oxygenated. So I'm just going to pant constantly. Don't worry about it. Also, short-term memory is totally shot, so I'll be referencing notes a lot, which, you know, with my students, I would have scolded them about this, but 
I'll consider it an accommodation for my current uh, restricted capacity. <laughs> so I've done all sorts of jobs over time. Uh, my first science job was as a planetarium presenter. Uh, and since then, it's been all over the place. When you think of a researcher, you probably think of a professor at a university or maybe like a lab-coated minion deep in the bowels of an industrial research and development laboratory. But the world has changed, and the gig economy is really, really strange. I'm a freelance scientist, which I swear is a real job. <laughs> it's, I paid rent for years. I had a mortgage. The whole works. It's something that you can actually do. Um, but what that means is I wear all sorts of different hats. There's a list up there, and actually that's probably not even complete anymore of the various job titles I've had. Um, I've been a professor here at UBC off and on. Last time was during the pandemic, during which I was telling all my students, go home, don't show up here. Go yell at the administrators, we shouldn't be here right now. Um, until we did finally switch to remote. Uh, and then at the moment I am a a uh, researcher with Project Espresso at the SETI Institute. I'm not chasing aliens, I am chasing landslides, <laughs> which is a fun thing to be doing. Um, but the core that holds all of these jobs and all of these titles together is to be curious and excited in public. That's what the actual job that I do is. Whew, and my screen turned sideways on me. So, People are born curious. Babies have to learn everything about the entire world around them. I knew this as a fact, and then I now have a toddler who's slowly figuring out gravity, and I'm learning it in a lot more detail. <laughs> so you have to learn everything from like what are hands to the ridiculously complicated physics that you have internalized about how to throw and catch things. Our societies are built around these structures of learning, that we're constantly developing new ways to transmit information and knowledge from one generation to the next. That's what you're doing here at UBC, and that we've done so much research into pedology at UBC and have transformed how we teach. In the, like, from the year I started here until now, I'm over in the Earth and Ocean Sciences Department, Earth, Ocean, Atmospheric Sciences Department. I don't even know if it's the same name anymore. <laughs> but have completely revamped how we teach as we learn how people learn. And this keeps turning off on me. Clearly, I have my settings wrong for this. You can tell I'm rusty and out of practice. We are constantly experimenting also with the classification systems of how do we put things into different categories of learning. And you know that those classifications and categories don't necessarily make sense. You're at an interdisciplinary conference. You're here to be dealing with crossing those boundaries. But somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way, that curiosity starts getting squished. Somewhere we start saying, you have to learn things in this proper order. And if you don't know something already, you should be embarrassed and ashamed and stop asking questions. Somewhere along the way, admitting we don't know something becomes shameful. <laughs> that we'd rather just bully through, try and bluff that we already know it all. That is painful. That hurts. That hurts on an individual level, but it also hurts on a societal level. On an individual level, it hurts us because it blocks people off from that joy of discovery, that joy of excitement, that learning something new, that putting pieces together, that moment of inspiration where you go, oh, I finally get it. Or this thing I learned over here can connect to this one over here. We put those pieces together and figure out something new, or at least new to me. But collectively, it's even more damaging. That creates barriers of pride and ego blocking us off from growing and changing. From climate change to societal unrest to the growing extremism to economic dysfunction, there are a lot of things going on right now that are extremely disheartening. 
I specialize in disasters and even I get burnt out on it looking around and going, oh, please, let us find a path forward. Let's find a path forward not just to survive, but to thrive and have something worth living. Those challenges are overwhelming. And quite honestly, they're too big to be indulgent and being complacent. We don't have the time and the space to give up, right? Like, it was bad enough for my generation, it's worse for yours, and for the next one down, we gotta give them something. So we need to explore new ways of thinking and new ways of doing things. We need to fit together our old ideas into new patterns. We need to take ideas and practices from one field and apply them in another. Something that's normal and common for you might be completely novel for somebody else. We need to take the core premise of research to evaluate what is working and what isn't. It's easy to gatekeep the idea of research, to say you need to have a fancy, idea, a, a fancy degree in order to be doing science. But at its heart, the essence of research is to explore the world around us, is to make a guess about how things work, test it out, and then to revise our ideas if they don't match. <laughs> I haven't spoken this long in one break for like a month and a half now. And I kind of underestimated just how difficult that would be. All right. Thank you for, for rolling with me on it. So we do these, this concept of research, this idea of cause and effect, of exploring our world around us every day in our ordinary lives. You do it every time you adjust a cookie recipe to better match what your taste preferences are. You do it every time you look at the weather report, then look outside and go, oh no, that's not what's going to happen today. When you use your lived experience and your local knowledge to just tweak things a little bit. But for such a simple concept, research is an incredibly powerful tool. We have in our repertoire the ability to evaluate cause and effect. And when we do that, we have the ability to build any future we want, which is such an unbelievably cool idea. It takes a lot of will. It takes a lot of resources. It takes cooperation. It takes collaborative work. It's not easy. But we can do anything. We can learn the consequences of our actions and then make choices to create any future we want. And that's an immensely powerful tool for a vulnerable, fragile, squishy little species clinging to this barren rock in the middle of a vast and indifferent universe. It's a tool that can transform some of these overwhelming problems into something tractable. Instead of flattening us with a sense of doom, or maybe that's just me, it can transform everything into something where we can cooperate, where we can make a better future. And I'm standing in exactly the wrong place for a feedback loop. There's a speaker around me somewhere, and I don't know where. <laughs> where we have the ability to make a more functional societies and to keep our planet pleasantly habitable instead of somewhere where we can just painfully survive. But none of us can take on these existential threats alone, and it takes co co cooperation and collaboration. Otherwise, it's just too big. It's too overwhelming. One of the core ideas of disaster management and disaster risk reduction is the idea of the barrier to entry. That people know that bad things can happen, they want to do something about it, but taking that first step feels too big and too hard. That if you're not gonna do it all, then why bother doing anything at all? You've probably also hit this when starting a big assignment, a paper where you're like, I just have a blank page and a blinking cursor, and if I could get four words in, I could get the whole way but those first four words are so hard. So finding ways past that barrier to entry is important. It's 
swear we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> I'm not done yet. <laughs> oh, but thank you. I appreciate the support for my efforts here. <sighs> Doing it in a mask is also super fun, but you know, it's important. We're also learning that. Taking that and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> then everything scrolls on me. Of course it does. Of course it does. I have to make sure I'm demonstrating all the worst aspects of presenting in public so that you can feel better about yourselves and anything that you guys do will look more polished than me because you can talk in full sentences. <laughs> so it takes, start, it takes starting small. It takes taking that first step that leads to another, that leads to another, that leads to another. It takes building that momentum of tiny moments that feel negligible when taken in isolation. And that is where encouraging curiosity comes into play. See, we're getting back to the beginning now. So curiosity is inherently vulnerable. You need to put yourself in a position where you don't know what's going on, where you might make mistakes or miscommunicate. You're not the expert. You don't know what to expect next. Whether it's learning in a classroom or researching something entirely new to human understanding, it comes with the possibility of being wrong. You take the chance, and if you're doing it in public, other people will see you being wrong. To truly learn, you have to risk your ego and see where the ideas take you. That kind of vulnerability is a skill. It's one you're very good at right now. You have passed the hurdles to get into one of the most competitive universities in Canada, and you did it during the massive upheaval that was pandemic. Now you're also voluntarily put yourself forward to participate in a research conference that's multidisciplinary, one that by its very definition, there are people in this room who know things that you know nothing about. You are going to spend this weekend going outside of your main focus. What you're doing right now, that's hard. I hope you don't get complacent and let those skills get rusty once you graduate. I hope that you take that vulnerability and that willingness to put yourself outside your comfort zone and hold on to it once you leave the scaffolding of academia and forge your own path without guidance. I hope you take that idea of lifelong learning and actually live it and not use it as a glib phrase in marketing materials and slick advertising and cover letters. But more than that, I hope you have the generosity of spirit and the empathy for how hard it is to admit not knowing something. I hope you keep an awareness of that difficulty and find the patience and kindness to help others brush off their own rusty skills at learning. The most important thing I've realized over the many years of gigs and industries I've tried is that sometimes people just need permission to be curious. That sounds weird, especially since one of my hats is as a professor here and my job is to stand up and tell people things. But most of the time, my job isn't even to inspire. My job is to create space for questions that if I do it well, as a natural consequence, people start getting curious and piecing together ideas in a new to them fashion. My job is essentially to enable. Sometimes I do this directly. Sometimes I can tell someone bluntly that it's okay to ask questions and to learn something new, which by the way, it's okay to ask questions and learn something new. <laughs> But most of the time, my job is to feed that curiosity and to model that vulnerability. By being excited and curious in public, I give other people permission to reconnect to their own curiosity and to take joy in exploring ideas that are new to them. They don't even need to be new to everybody. It's okay to have that experience that there's an XKCD comic about of, are you today's lucky 1,000? who are going to try out putting Mentos in a Diet Coke. It sounds like a simple concept, 
is so basic, it's a little bit embarrassing. It took me so long to figure it out. But again, you're here, which means you've encountered enough simple ideas to realize that simple does not mean easy. <laughs> Newton's laws are simple, but that doesn't mean <laughs> the application of mass times acceleration isn't literally rocket science. What I try to do is to meet people where they are and then support them as they embrace their enthusiasm for whatever quirk of the universe has caught their attention. Then use that as a lens to share how a researcher would look at things. I'll take a break to go next slide anyway. <laughs> If we can help people see the world as a researcher, this is the evil spot. I think maybe I'm hitting your microphone. I think that might be my feedback loop. Um, distracted, again, things they don't warn you about. Um, blah, 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 here we go. Uh, so, if we can find that hook, if we can find that exploration and that beginning of curiosity again, then maybe we can re-engage after the years of bruised egos and go, it's okay. You can come back out now. We're not gonna hurt you for asking questions. And if you can do that, if you can reach, if you can connect, you can get that spark of curiosity and get it burning into an inferno. That sometimes all you need to do is help someone take that first step and help them see that it's okay to learn, that it's okay to be curious, that it's okay to explore and to do something new, that it's okay to walk outside that comfort zone, and then suddenly they're off. Again, a toddler has made that much more true for me of realizing how often that fall down, stand up, and start walking really actually does translate into running. It's a year ago this kid was someone I could keep up with, and now I am even more out of breath with them. Some of the questions I get asked are life and death serious. I get asked about answering questions about earthquakes and aftershocks by people huddled under tables having just been jolted by a massive earthquake who don't know the same knowledge base I do, but understand it's important. I've done talking heads on TV shows and news broadcasts helping people figure out how to interpret what's going on around them. I've also done all sorts of goofy things, like looking at the math and the science of ball gowns and high heels, of connecting with that passion and joy and going, you know what? Yeah, there's a lot of material science in this too. Quite honestly, I would never want to look at any of the Met Gala gowns and face it on one of my physics tests. I would have definitely failed that exam. Sometimes it's talking to people at parties about how even throwing a party and meeting your neighbors is the first step to disaster resilience, and that packing a go bag can be as simple as what would you normally do to survive a day on campus, and then just add a little bit more. But sometimes others take advantage of my other hat the one where I'm on set, and I'm essentially the personal tutor for screenwriters, helping them understand all the funny little quirks that could make for good plot twists, or keeping people entertained backstage, behind the scene and between takes, answering the questions that they wish they had somebody to give them the answers for. I've been asked about the potential mechanics of time machines, or the ramifications of feeding the energy of a solar flare into a black hole. Some of the throwaway conversations we had about the Apollo missions and seismics ended up as verbatim lines in the movie Moonfall when it came out. Other times, between takes, I've been quizzed on the latest science discoveries to make it on the news, or asked about the unintuitive dynamics, aerodynamics of dragonflies. I've been asked about the science of my show's problems or the delicate dance of or my, <laughs> my show's fictional problems. Not big questions about like, hey, why is there a plot hole? That's somebody else's issue. 
But I've also been asked about how do you do that delicate dance between creating science and fiction for entertainment, but not accidentally feeding into conspiracy theories. But my favorite genre questions are the ones at pop culture conventions and fandom events. They usually start with an apology. Somebody comes up to me and says, I'm not very good at math. I haven't done science since elementary school. And then they start in telling me about their fandom and laying out all of the details of this fictional starship and its particular mechanics of how it does interstellar travel, and then ask me what the ramifications of that could be. That they are taking something that is purely imaginary, but applying the process of science and research to it. That is fictional, and yet the tools are the same as the research tools we use in real life. None of it pretends to be true, but the framework and the structures are the same as the ones you use when approaching real life problem. Those questions are easy to dismiss as being inherently goofy and unimportant. Is the CDC, the Center of Disease Control, talking about, do you have your zombie attack plan? They're not actually asking about your zombie attack plan, but by doing that, by start starting that structure and starting that conversation, you're thinking about what would you do if there's a cataclysmic earthquake at UBC? Drop cover and hold on, please. When you hear those questions, they're a gateway to help someone harness their love for a story, a setting for characters, and embrace that vulnerability of learning. It's your chance to take that enthusiasm and be playful and curious and experimenting and exploring. And often it's a lower risk way of doing it, that your ego is less involved if it's play than if it's work. Your experience here at UBC means you're growing expertise. You're going to be encountering different openings than I do. I work in disasters. We talk about zombie attacks. You're going to have your own expertise and your own questions. Maybe it'll be a drunken hypothetical at 2 AM at a kitchen party. It could be a social media post you're responding to or answering questions on. Or it could be just idle chit chatter while waiting to pick up your coffee. But all of those are openings. And the trick is to recognize them as openings, to take that as a, a collaborative game of improvisation, of yes and, of yes, here's your question, and let's nudge it forward. It doesn't need to be a big deal. It doesn't need to be something profound. It can be just a little nudge to encourage curiosity. Yes, it's small. Yes, it's simple. But if we each take those chances to add a bit more curiosity in the world, we're nudging us to a more interesting future. It also means that we're adding to a world where people think about cause and effect in their decision making, and where if we're really lucky in making their policies. We can each help those around us embrace their curiosity. We'll be helping them find their joy the evil spot, the evil spot with the feedback loop. We'll be helping them find their joy and reconnect to their curiosity, but more selfishly, we'll also be creating a basis for people to ask questions that can keep that a little bit of a researcher going in them in their day-to-day -day lives. Then maybe when people start thinking about actions and consequences and how we can shift what we have will help start building a better future, one that's a little bit less ominous. It's not easy, but it is simple. And it's something that you can start this weekend. You have the opportunity to start small, a little piece at a time, and grow curiosity. So that's my challenge to you. With all of these posters, all of these conferences, all of these presentations going on this weekend, there are going to be people talking about things that you know nothing about. I want you to try and ask questions and try not to be embarrassed when it's obvious you have no idea what you're talking about. Be willing to learn and to be open to it. Be OK about looking a little bit foolish and let somebody else be the expert and teach you. 
make it obvious you have no idea. It's okay. It's a safe place for it. Learn something new for no other reason than because you can. And when you hear or you see somebody else taking those chances, try and support them. Encourage them. Teach them the lens and the tools of your discipline that might be unfamiliar to them. And most importantly, I want you to have fun this weekend. Find that curiosity not because you're being graded on it, but because you can. And hopefully we're getting back on time so you can have a little bit of like a bathroom break and coffee before you have to run off to the next spot. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Professor McKinnon, for your wise words. And I hope that all our presenters remember that you can take pride in where your curiosity has led you so far and where it may take you in the future. Today is going to be a day full of opportunities to learn, network, and grow, whether you're a new or seasoned presenter, a supporter, or a delegate. To enrich your conference experience, we've curated a panel of diverse and inspiring candidates who range in experience from social justice and rehabilitation to sustainability and game design, which you can see in Ponderosa Commons North from 2.45 to 3.30 p.m. today. They'll be fielding questions based on their undergraduate research experience as well as their personal career and academic paths so far. We also have an Ask Me Anything session happening from 2 to 2.30 p.m. today in Ponderosa Commons North, and it will feature two hosts simultaneously. The first one will be Ritwik Badacharji, whose topics of interest include psychosociology and settler colonialism. And the second room will be hosted by Adrian Kinman, whose topics of interest include neuroscience and memory. So we invite you to pick the session that aligns the best with your goals and interest and ask them anything about grad school or applications or just their research in general. In addition, since you all attended keynote, we're giving everybody here three raffle tickets to enter into the draw at closing reception for a chance to win prizes and other gift cards. And if you want to see the full list of places where you can win, ra win raffle tickets, you can scan the program guide here. It has information about the conference schedule and about all of the featured programming. Finally, we have the photo booth happening in Ponderosa, as well as a presenter exclusive mix and match mingle game. Um, the QR codes for that are posted all around Ponderosa and in Swing Space. And if you guys fill out the form by 7 p.m. today, you'll have the chance to um, win one of three gift cards. Um, for the photo booth, if you tag UVC Merck, you will get a chance to enter into a draw um, to win a Starbucks gift card as well. So just a few logistical reminders before we let you go. Uh, please remember that if you want to see the conference schedule, you can just look it up at UBC Merck website as well. We've got it posted in all the buildings. If you do have any questions throughout the day, please flag down one of our event volunteers. They'll be wearing lanyards like this and are happy to answer your questions. And finally, we'll just be abiding by UBC's policies, so we ask you respect everyone's comfort level with masks. With that out of the way, we just want to say a big good luck to presenters. We hope you don't feel too nervous. And in the spirit of our theme this year, Aspire and Inspire, presenters, we encourage you to seek out someone in a completely different field and compare what inspired you to pursue research and what research aspirations do you have for the future. To our delegates, we hope you enjoy listening and learning from all of the presenters here today, and we challenge you to leave the conference knowing three new facts that you can pass on to someone else. With that, we invite you all to join us to our Wave 2 presentations. Posters will be in the Ponderosa Ballroom, and oral presentations will be in the Swing Space and Ponderosa Commons North, all of which will be beginning at 11 a.m. If you haven't had a chance to register yet and you are in Wave 2, you can just go back out to the front and register before the Wave. Otherwise, registration will be moving to Ponderosa Commons North for all the other Waves, so you can check in there and get your name tag if you haven't yet. On behalf of the Merck 2023 Planning Committee, we thank you for coming to our opening ceremonies, and please enjoy Merck 2023.